Good deal. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a secret life of a rogue device. Um, my wife told me not to tell anybody who helped me with these slides and make them look beautiful, so I'm just going to say a beautiful anonymous woman helped me make these look nice. Uh, the earlier format was much uglier, I assure you. So, yeah, quick background, I'm Matthew. Uh, my friends call me mandatory. I've uh, worked on a variety of security projects, things like XSS Hunter, uh, Cursed Chrome, and I write security research at thehackerblog.com. In my professional life, I also lead the Red Team at Snap. So this talk's sort of about, quote unquote, rogue hardware, uh, ending up on the second-hand online electronics markets. So what do I mean by rogue? I mean things that shouldn't end up there. So this is kind of a few key categories, right? Things like employee laptops, which you're probably familiar with, right? That shouldn't be resold, maybe has sensitive data on it, stuff like that. Uh, it means things like prototypes, so early development version of your favorite products, maybe like the iPhones that you enjoy, right? Earlier stages when they were first being built, right? And then sort of like more specialized things like factory line equipment and you know backup hard drives, stuff like that. So that's sort of what we'll be covering. The main questions we're going to be answering here is some of them are pretty obvious, right? It's like how often does this actually happen, right? Is this a problem, right? And then for the stuff that does end up here, you know, on these secondary markets, what's the impact? Is there anything security related that we have to worry about? And then, you know, ultimately, what is it that actually ends up getting resold like this? Along the way, we'll sort of figure out like, you know, what are the challenges of, of doing research in this space? Um, once we figure those out, we'll have to scale it up to sort of do all of the listings across Western and Eastern markets. And then we'll finish up with everybody's favorite part, which is like war stories and loot and all that cool stuff. Great, so what are the challenges to finding rogue hardware? First one is probably pretty obvious. You probably already guessed it. We gotta get it from somewhere. So what are the places that stuff gets resold on, right? So if you're, you know, from the US, you're probably familiar with eBay, right, for the Western side of things. There's also other things like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, but those are generally a little bit more local, right? You, they might expect you to show up, and you know, that's kind of hard to scale out, so we want stuff where you can sort of ship it. So we'll kind of focus on eBay on this side. On the Eastern side, you know, sort of where all the electronics are assembled and actually put together, right, where things are manufactured, uh, there's another market which you may not be as familiar with. I apologize to the native Chinese speakers here. I'm going to butcher this word, but Shen Yu is the app that they have there, um, which is much larger than uh, I thought it was going to be. Um, but this is basically the secondhand market in China. So if you want to resell something there. So we know the where, but the second challenge is like sellers don't usually make listings like this. They're not like, hey, this is a secret you know, prototype for this crazy product thing, right? Usually the sellers don't even know what it is that they're selling, right, in many of these cases. And they're not just going to put that in a listing where we could easily find it. So how do we deal with that? Um, I'll give you a little spoiler. Uh, a lot of the information that we actually want is more in the images, right? So it's not in any text, but it's actually in the text in embedded in the images themselves. If you have, again, a company laptop, probably a sticker on the bottom that says property of whatever or asset tag, you know, whatever. Uh, so we have to dig a little bit deeper to find the answer to this stuff, right, to figure out the real truth of where these are. So assuming that we get all the stuff from where we've, right, we've talked about and then we sort of analyze those images and do all this stuff, right, we still have to know kind of like what we're looking for, right? So in the case of prototypes, like I mentioned, there's like secret code words, secret labeling conventions they use. Uh, for, I mentioned before, for employee laptops, there's special barcode formats and whatever else, right? So we have to sort of figure out what these are in order to identify when these things show up. And let's talk about sort of building a pipeline for detecting this rogue hardware at scale. Probably unsurprisingly, the first challenge is we got to scrape the hell out of a bunch of sites, right? So I mentioned before, we'll, we'll focus on two main sites here, eBay and Shenyu. We'll start off with eBay because it's dramatically easier to scrape. You'll see why. Uh, so on the eBay side, this is pretty simple. You just do searches for the kind of products you're looking for, right? Something like laptop or phone or whatever it is. Uh, you scrape the resulting listings and you extract the images out of them so we can do analysis on them. But we have a hurdle. And this is pretty much the case for any major site, right? They'll have some form of rate limiting, right, to prevent either bots or whatever it is. Uh, in the case of eBay, if you do too many requests, they give you this fake 404 page saying, hey, uh, you know, you're doing that too much and they're trying to fool you into thinking this page doesn't exist. Luckily, the modern internet is not quite as simple as it used to be, right? We have like CDN services in the middle of a lot of things to sort of speed up page loads and optimize content being served at the edge, right? And we can use this to our advantage to circumvent this rate limiting. So in the case of, of eBay, you know, they essentially have an allow list from all of Cloudflare, which is a popular CDN's like IP ranges that said, hey, if it's coming from here, 
don't bother with the rate limiting, just allow unlimited requests, right? So Cloudflare allows you to make workers, which come from like their space, right? So I just simply uploaded a, a Cloudflare worker, which proxy to eBay. And so by using this as a proxy, I can get around all the rate limiting and do unlimited requests. So super easy. We've got that problem solved. Moving right along. All right, so in the, in the China side, right, Shen Yu, it's not quite as easy. In fact, you go to their website and you don't see like anything at all. It just says like, hey, download our app to continue. And you're like, all right. So you go to their, you know, your local app store, you download their web, their, their little app, and you start browsing for listings on this, right? Of course, if we want to do this at scale and do any scraping, this is not going to cut it. So we got to crack open the app. We remove cert pinning. And under the hood, we find that it has a total custom signing API for all of their requests. So they basically generate some cryptographic material. They sign all the requests. So they have to be byte perfect and be signed properly. Otherwise, the servers will just reject your requests. On top of this, even if you do those requests, you get responses where the fields are actually encrypted in their proprietary format. So you have to be able to figure out how to get rid of that as well. And of course, they implement their own capture system. So if you're doing a lot of these requests, right, and you're not logged in, they're going to spawn this and you have to solve this. And uh, you're like, it's too easy. There's still more. Uh, all of that stuff uh, is not done like in the Java where it might be easier to reverse, right? It's done deep inside the obfuscated JNA binary, right? So you're going to have to pull out some assembly and start cooking, right? Um, really great job, actually, like by the team. They did a good job of doing the antibot stuff here. Uh, but for us, this is just like a skill issue. So we're going to have to get around all of this shit, right? If any of you have ever done Android reverse engineering before, you have personally been on this scale. You start off and you're like reading a blog post, you're like, dude, Frida's sick. I can just hook all these functions and like I don't have to do any reverse engineering. Look like easy. And then eventually you start like becoming like I'm the real deal. I learn assembly, I can reverse engineer stuff, I can actually just figure out their custom thing and like re-implement it in my own language and it's super leaf. And then they do an update and it breaks all your shit and you're like, wait a minute. Every update I'm gonna have to do like three hours of reversing, no fucking thank you. And so you go back to Frida, right? So in this case we just skip to the end. So I wrote a, a custom thing to basically, uh, basically open the app, click through all the prompts, do initial requests, and do the fun like thumb capture sliding thing automatically. And then once it's into the state where it can start actually doing these requests, it does a Frida uh, server and does an injection. So we can basically hand it an HTTP request that we want it to sign for us, and it will return us the signed request that we can then send to their API server. Uh, so this is essentially what it looks like. You've got like a rooted phone with a server and essentially it does the signing proxying for us, right? And then we send that off over a residential proxy to make the request. End result looks something like this. Again, cable management was not me. It was much uglier when I did it. So this gives us a good way to sort of find new sellers, right? We do searches, we get their seller IDs, and now we've got a good base to actually scrape the items that we want here. So when I said that there's like no websites, that was kind of a lie. Uh, they do have a special like preview thing for ostensibly growth reasons, right? So you can like share a link in the app with somebody else and they don't have to have the app to see it. And it's like a little, it'll show you the listing information, but then when you try to buy it, right, it's like download our app. So that sounds like a, a great way to get around this, but there's kind of an, a, a caveat, right? The rate limiting here is severe. And I don't mean like you're like, wow, this like three previews, you view it and it's like, no, 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 no more, no more previews, you gotta log in. And so this means that we're going to need like a lot of IP addresses. Uh, so even for like the crappy budget networks, this is going to be a lot of IP addresses. So I had to do a little bit of digging, pun intended. And uh, I was like, oh, it's available over IPv6. Last time I checked, I think there's a lot more IPv6 IPs out there than IPv4. So I think there might be a solution here. So I went straight to the source for, you know, for me, this is like the North American uh, number registry, which is Aaron, right? You can apparently get a FAT36 range IPv6 right allocation, and it only costs like 250 bucks a year. And so with this, you actually the number of IPs is a bigger number that I can even pronounce. But you essentially have unlimited IP space that you can now utilize. I combine this with a piece of software that my friend wrote, which essentially takes like if you have a box where you write all the IP addresses to, this turns it into like a Sox, a Sox proxy server where every request you make to it, it will randomize it through the outbound range that you have set up, right? So now we can just start blasting from unlimited, this huge range, right, with unlimited IPs, and rate limiting is, we'll call it more or less solved, right? We may never come from the same IP twice. Great. Scraping is solved. Let's talk about that second challenge, right? Again, that challenge is that the secrets that we want are probably not outright in the listing description, right? They're hidden, right? We have to, maybe the seller doesn't even know what it is that they're selling. So how do we address this, right? 
the key way that we do this is uh, via OCR, right? So uh, there's some problems with this in practice. You've probably heard of op open source solutions, but you have things like this, where Apple does their very chic gray on silver design. And even some humans have issues reading this text, right? And computers are no different. When I plug this into the open source Tesseract model, right, it basically said, there's no text on this. I have no idea what you're talking about. So that was like not going to fly. Um, I looked at some like proprietary APIs, right? There's Google Vision. Google Vision actually did a great job. I was like, wow, I got all the text that I could, you know, want me to get out of this, right? But then I sort of looked at the pricing and I was like, oh, well, one penny for seven images, that's pretty good. But then I was like, wait, so for a million images, that's 1,500 bucks and we're doing hundreds of millions of images. So yeah, that's not really tenable. Um, but I had sort of a eureka moment when I was actually using my iPhone. I had one of those old school captures, you know, before the current more annoying like grid ones, uh, where essentially I held my thumb down and I realized that I could actually select the warped text and I could copy it. And I was like, wait, iOS is an OCR model? This is sick. And uh, I could paste it and it got it exactly right. So I was like, there, there might be something here. And uh, not only is it available, you can actually, like, if you just write an app, you can integrate with this API and automate it. So I wrote some of the ugliest Swift code any of you have probably ever seen and made a little HTTP server where I could send it an image and it would do OCR in English and Chinese and uh, do barcode detection. And uh, this basically solved it. Um, but you're probably like, okay, you, you can use an iPhone, but that's got to be expensive, right? Like iPhones are super expensive. But in fact, the GPU acceleration uh, chip actually goes back as far as the iPhone uh, second generation SE. And, not, and if you get those on like, you know, Cricket Wireless or some unpopular carrier, right, they're sold for as little as 40 bucks. Uh, so you can get these for super cheap and you can build yourself a, a high capacity OCR array. So I wired a bunch of these together uh, and I had a high capacity array that could do around 50 HD images a second in English and Chinese, even with a lot of text and barcode detection as well. And to make it even better, it basically uses no power because the mobile like compute is actually super efficient. So it worked out really well. Great. So we scraped all this shit. We got all these images. We can do OCR on all these images. We index all of it. But now we need to know what we're looking for, right? So I started off with just looking like general examples of like prototypes and company laptops and sort of built a very early set of keywords to alert on. And when I found matches to those alerts for products that were listed, anything else on the laptops that they had, I then added those marks to my list of things to alert for, right? So maybe I had some text that was like property of, then I get a barcode and I'd see what their barcode format was and then I would add that to my rules. And it's iterative, right? So every time I get more results, I'm improving my rule sets and pretty soon I've got a huge alert list of keywords that when something comes up, I can immediately get notified of it. I made this a little bit easier by building like a nice little data lake UI so I can just type in, if I see type any keyword and it will immediately start showing me matching listings so I can very quickly cook these things up. Talked about a lot of pieces overall but this is kind of the 10,000 foot view. Uh, you've got the most convoluted set of like free to server bullshit combined with like exit proxying combined with like Elasticsearch and iPhone OCRs but TLDR took a lot to do this with uh, the level of data that we're doing. Overall, we're talking about uh, much more now, but probably like 50 million listings scraped, right? We're talking over 250 million images OCR'd in total, right? None of the iPhones are exploded yet. Very great work. Said there was only three challenges. It's actually kind of 3.5. So imagine you're selling something on eBay and some random person in like some remote province of China says, hey, could you just like ship this to me? And you'd be like, dude, I don't know how to do paperwork for Canada, let alone like you know, this place in China, right? And it's so different if you ask somebody in you know, domestic Chinese markets to say, hey, could you ship this to me in like, you know, Alabama or whatever it is, right? So we kind of have to figure out like, how could we work in these markets and buy from local sellers when we ourselves like don't, maybe don't speak the language, don't understand the culture and want to get it like exported to us. So where can this secret knowledge be found? Uh, luckily, there's a community who's very familiar with the domestic Chinese market built around like really high-end fake uh, fashion replicas. So, you know, your Gucci handbag that's like indistinguishable or whatever from the real one. Uh, there's a community that kind of focuses on basically getting these from inside of the domestic Chinese market and they use these agents which will actually do their work of communicating with the seller, they'll buy it and they'll actually like rewrap it for you and do all the export forms to get it to you. So we basically use the exact same stuff that they use to get these designer clothes and we kind of have this solved. So this is what you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. Let's go to the loot, some of what we found here. Before we get, we'll start off with employee devices here. 
Um, before we sort of get into these, uh, we'll spell some very quick, like, well, actually, things that I'm sure you're going to want to say. And one of the common rebuttals I hear is like, sure, you can find this hardware leaking out, but it's it's probably all locked and uh, it requires a passcode to access them or whatever. So there's no way that you can like actually do this, right? Uh, my rebuttal in this case is merely a slide. Obviously, there's a lot more examples, but there's only so much space. Um, plenty of notable examples here, right? And you're like, okay, 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 okay. You, they're unlocked. I get it, I get it. But that doesn't mean that there's actually anything sensitive on the devices, right? And again, I only have a slide as a rebuttal. Um, again, many more examples, right? And uh, if, if you're like, my company is not affected. If you work for a Fortune 500 company, guarantee you have seen your, your equipment end up on eBay or some other market, right? Super wide uh, breadth of, if you do any volume of employee equipment or whatever, it's going to be here. So let's talk about the war stories. Um, I want to actually do a quick little preface here. All of my examples are for a pretty popular company called Apple. Um, this is not because Apple like fucked up especially. Actually, it's pretty much the opposite. They were like a mature hardware company and my point of the research targeting like their stuff was more because like if it affects them, we can be pretty sure that any other company is affected as well, right? They have, they have resources, right, to make this right. So uh, we'll start out with the story of the time capsule. So I built up a good little you know, database of alerts and keywords for those things and eventually I got alerted to a time capsule that was listed in the United Kingdom. And the reason why I got an alert is I had this cool sticker on the background which said property of Apple Computers Inc, expensed equipment. And I was like, hmm, this might be interesting. And uh, I looked at the description and it said this, it said, hey, it was part of an office clearance, good sign. Uh, it's been powered up and lights up as expected, but it has not been tested beyond this point. This is the perfect description for if you think something's going to be good because it means the device works. We couldn't wipe it ourselves because we couldn't really get it like turned on and like all set up, right? But we, we can be pretty sure that like it's at least in the original state that maybe they got it in, right? So I also did some Googling and there was actually an office clearance for Apple that like they moved offices. So it seemed like it lined up. So I placed a bid. Um, I, I didn't realize how big the shipping was. It was actually like almost like it was like more than the actual device itself. So I kind of learned that lesson the hard way, but we'll take a risk. Got into the United States. After uh, sweating with a heat gun and getting the back off and pulling the hard drive out, I was able to connect it up to my laptop to start doing like, uh, to look at the drive, right? And uh, initially I looked at it and I was like, oh, sh you know, shoot, uh, there's no files. Looks like they deleted them. I was like, unless, unless they deleted it and they didn't actually do a secure wipe of it. So maybe they're still hanging around. Let's just, just in case, let's do a forensic scan of this thing, right? So I let this thing run. That cooked for around 28 hours. Uh, for two terabytes, which is quite a while. And uh, it turns out that's not entirely true. There was data on the device. Things like internal credentials, things like internal support tickets, sales reports and figures, internal documentation, apps, repair guides, internal emails, bank account information, passport and ID scans. And I, I swear this last one is true. Dank internal memes from these Apple stores in Europe. There was literally an entire video done in like the Backstreet Boys style of how to count the inventory in your Apple store. I kid you not. It hurt me so much to like hand this back over. So <laughs> anyways, uh, I got this and I was like, all right, this is scary. I got to tell Apple about this, right? I used the only, only channel they had for reporting, which was like their regular um, like sort of uh, bug bounty reporting queue thing and said, hey, I've got this time capsule. Looks like it's from like the 2010s. It's got like a bunch of Euro stored data and you probably want this. Um, you know, I got this, I, I originally submitted this actually to them and I got, I think some regular like product security person who's like, uh, I do bugs. Like, I don't know what the, f what this is or what I'm supposed to do with it. And he's just like, I sent an email to our internal t like people, but there's nothing I can do with this. So I originally was like, oh, this is easiest disclosure ever. It's like already over. But then I got an email later from their GSOC in London, which was like, hey, we actually do, we would very much like that drive. And uh, you're in the Bay Area, right? Could you just like drive 10 minutes and drop that off for us? <laughs> and I was like, sure, you know, lunch break, head over there, dropped it off to them. And I was like, good deal. And I sent an email saying, we're all good. The disclosure is all finished. And I was like, cool, done deal. Uh, later on, I received an update like later that night where they were like, hey, uh, any other POCs off that drive that you can send us just to assess the impact of the report? And I was kind of like, but I already gave you the drive. So like, how would I, how would I do that? Cause like, obviously I don't have the data. I gave it back to you. Right. So I was kind of like, well, I think it was just communication between the team, but I was kind of like a little bit like, what's the deal here? 
Cool. So let's talk about prototypes, right? Another one of those like main columns I mentioned. Um, they usually look something like this, right? Lots of scary hardware labels in the back. Um, usually a phone number to report it being missing. Um, and Apple actually has some pretty interesting uh, prototypes. Uh, they're a little bit more valuable than your regular prototype that you might find. Um, here's a bunch of stuff that I was able to get over doing this research. Um, this is actually a small part of a lot of the prototypes I was able to find. Um, so the reason why Apple prototypes are a little bit more interesting is because they have something called dev fusing in a lot of their prototype versions of the iPhone, right? And you're like, what the hell is dev fusing? Essentially, you need a production iPhone that you buy from the store, right? They actually burn these fuses, which prevent you from being able to do debugging of the application processor and the secure enclave processor, right? And so when you do exploit development, you've kind of heard these like million dollar or whatever iPhone exploits. Having one of these phones is key because it allows you to really easily debug your exploit to make, you know, get it, pull it off essentially. So there's like a big gray market spawned off of this. Apple actually has researcher devices that they'll give you uh, if you follow a bunch of legal procedures to get yourself. Uh, but you know, there's still people that don't want to deal with that, so there's still this big gray market, right? But there's these TLDR, there's these super rare iPhones which are useful for security research, right? Um, this is sort of what that looks like. They have different fusing states. If you have the debugging cable, you can basically plug the iPhone in and say, yes, this is a dev fused iPhone. So again, uh, on around, around November 23rd, 2023, I had a, my pipeline alerted to a bunch of listings being created at once in China. Uh, they were all iPhone 14s. And initially, you know, when I get a bunch of alerts at once, I'm like, oh, somebody's reposted their listing like eight times or whatever. But then I started to look at the photos and I was like, wait a minute, these are all distinct iPhones. This is not like one iPhone that's been repeatedly posted. Uh, and so it turned out this is actually a huge cache of these uh, prototype iPhone 14s, which at the time was the latest model of iPhone, right? So um, this is like a, a video of the seller. Uh, furthermore, when I actually bought uh, one of these iPhones and imported it here, uh, I realized that the seller, when he was sort of taking pictures to validate the camera worked, uh, he didn't turn off the GPS tagging feature in the photos. So I actually had the exact location in China where the seller actually was. And uh, worse than that, uh, he also took selfies to validate the camera. <laughs> so in terms of like finding the source of these leaks, this is a pretty compelling way to do that, right? But I don't want to give you the wrong impression. It's not just that these you know, prototype iPhones will only come from like, you know, wherever in China that they're made. It actually, ironically, so I live in the Bay Area, it's either in these remote provinces of China or it's a 10 minute drive from my house with very little in between. So in this case, like this was one that was leaked in uh, San Francisco, right? It's a, a DVT model iPhone 14 and it did indeed have death using, right? The, the most hilarious part about this actually is that the sellers oftentimes when they have these, they try to do like a regular restore of the device only to realize like, this is a weird iPhone. I can't restore this. I have no idea what's going on here. And they're just like, I got, I'll sell it for parts, whatever. And so the listings are sold usually for parts when it's actually like a very, you know, expensive prototype iPhone, right? Cool. So we kind of covered a couple examples here. We talked about the time capsule. We talked about these the rare prototype devices, right? Let's go to the thing, the place where these things are made, right? So in this case, the assembly line is for Foxconn for Apple for the most part, right? So I looked at a lot of these Chinese listings, uh, things that had like, you know, a bunch of labels that appeared to be related to Foxconn, right? And I started to realize that there was a pattern that was starting to emerge when I looked at these things, right? So if it's used inside of Foxconn, I started to realize that, hey, it usually has this like, you know, three letter, four letter, six digit combo thing that they use to label like internal equipment. And so I created a quick rule that anytime something like this shows up in China, why don't you let me know and I'll take a look at it, right? I'm sure all of you can sort of see where this might be going. Uh, sometime later, I got an alert for a listing like this uh, for only 180 yuan. This is like $28, I think, in USD. And uh, when I took a closer look at it, it had all the markings that I wanted. Uh, and I looked at the bottom of it, and there was an interesting hole drilled in the bottom. And I was like, oh, okay, so like they basically took a drill press to this thing to like securely destroy it and you know what, can get rid of the hard drive. Um, but then I, I thought about it a little bit more and I was like, wait a minute, let me look up a schematic of what this looks like inside. And I was like, okay, so if like the hard drive is here and uh, that means the magnetic platter is here and they drilled the hole like here. <laughs> there might be a chance. And this is one of those things where I'm like, there's no way, but it would be too cool if it works. So I bought it, brought it into the United States again you know, uh, disassembled it, pulled the hard drive out, I looked inside and I saw that beautiful orange PCB color and I was like, I think they might have missed it, but let's, let's send it to the experts. Uh, so 
I shopped around a little bit, found a cheap lab down in LA to, to, that said, hey, they gave me the honest answer, which is exactly what I was looking for, where they were basically like, all right, listen, you drilled a hole in the damn thing. Like, if, if you did that, you didn't turn it on, and there's not a bunch of dust and all these other things, then yeah, I think we can recover it. But don't get your hopes up, like, be aware, right? So I sent it down to them. They basically, after some time, came back to me and they said, hey, uh, you know, we, we popped this thing open. It looks like it just hit the PCB, and uh, in order to recover it, we basically had to buy a working drive, go into a clean room, and swap the magnetic platter from one to the other. Obviously, after getting this email, I was like, so just to be clear, you're saying they did miss the magnetic platter, and they were like, yep, it pretty much missed everything. Uh, so it looks like there might be a chance here. There's not a lot of dust even on the platter, so I think we might be good. Sometime later, I got the email that I was looking for, where they said, hey, I got 99.99 whatever percent of the data, and I was like, oh yeah, it's all coming together. But I was still like, if you do a lot of this research, you always try to like hold off on being too excited because your dreams have been crushed too many times by it not working out. So I was like, you know, maybe, maybe somebody actually bought it, reused it, and then they drilled the hole in it. So like, you know, maybe it's not actually the real thing, but it was. Uh, these are the wallpapers from it being used in the factory line. It was used to do Q&A ostensibly for, actually a couple things it looked like, but for iPad QA it looked like. Uh, it came along with a bunch of really tasty internal Apple software for sort of interfacing with their prototype devices and doing QA on the line. All of that good stuff, right? It came with internal credentials for the Foxconn factory and a bunch of other cool stuff. A lot of cool Apple tooling too with a bunch of like, you could tell engineers came up with the name of these tools, right? Like footing, whatever, so. <laughs> Uh, another funny story about this one is when I gave this one to Apple. Like the first time, there was a lot of mis a lot of communication when it came to the time capsule, like back and forth to coordinate it. The second time, I was like, "Hey, I've got this random drive from the Foxconn line. I got did this forensics. I got all this data. I want to give it back to you." They were just like, "Here's a prepaid FedEx envelope. You just drop that shit in the mail. Get it right to us." I was like, "Sweet." Great. So we've got some cool POCs. We want to kind of show off the problem, right? Let's go into like maybe what are the high level like takeaways of this whole stuff, right? Uh, so one thing that's kind of interesting is like this is not like, you know, you think of like the conventional hacking stories and sort of like, um, you know, cracking code or whatever, but this research raises kind of an interesting question, which is like, have I done anything sort of unethical or wrong here, right? If you talk about the source of a lot of these other prototypes, we're talking about pretty illicit stuff, right? They're paying somebody, I assume, to take it off the factory line or whatever it is. But we're not, we're not doing that. We're just literally looking for public listings. We come to the table with a little bit more information about what is in those like, listings and what it actually means, right? And ostensibly, they would have been sold anyways, but we just instead buy it in the first place, right? So have we like really done anything wrong? You know what I mean? So it's just a very interesting question there. Um, I think another potentially interesting takeaway here is, you know, you're probably more familiar when we have like very standardized uh, full disk encryption and mobile device management for like the standard set of things. So you get your work laptop, things are pretty well understood there. You have your like work phone, MDM solutions, FD solutions are pretty straightforward. But then when you get to the more custom hardware side, you don't necessarily have that level of maturity. I think it's like the time capsule, right? It's like, is there a clear suite that can, that can actually do, ensure that these things work the way that you expect? And so I would assume that this probably extends to any other type of custom hardware where you don't have this very standardized format of software to protect this. This one is probably obvious for anybody who's done anything related to hardware or who lives through COVID. Uh, supply chains are incredibly difficult, right? You've got multiple sides of the globe on different time zones doing iterations on hardware. And it's not like software where you're halfway through and you're like, ah, oh, let's just can all of this and rewrite it. You're kind of, your parameters are slowly narrowing and you've got to like, uh, throughout all this time, make sure none of them leak out and everything's securely destroyed and all this stuff, right? You got to keep everybody super tight lipped. So it's very challenging to do this, right, across many countries and to deliver this final product. Another interesting point, as you noted with one of these examples, is leaks very much point to sources. So you mentioned, like, we found listings where these things sort of bubbled up, right? And we can then take those to go to the sellers to figure out, like, what's the real story here? Where did this shit actually come from? And we can start to understand a full picture of, like, where is my stuff breaking apart? How is this stuff leaking out, right? So it becomes a very good opportunity to sort of identify these sources and ultimately close them if you're the company. I think another really interesting piece of this too is I would say that like e-waste is a particularly interesting point, right? So if you have your stuff going to e-waste, a lot of people sort of assume like, oh, it's going to be destroyed. But then you get people who are at the e-waste side who are like, why are they throwing away 50 good iPhones? Like this could be resold right now. Like it's very strange, right? 
And so a lot, a lot of these, I think, leaked out from sort of e-waste recycling centers, right? And this is what causes these problems. So you got to make sure that like your stuff is actually being destroyed and not being you know, essentially diverted and potentially resold. Uh, I just want to give a quick, quick special thanks to Apple Demo. He does a bunch of iPhone uh, prototype stuff. Uh, check out his YouTube for helping me sort of the initial research and understanding of this space. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this.